Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first installment of the video review series to accompany George Bendix's Organic Chemistry 1 course at the University of Pittsburgh. My name is Eric Bergen, and I'll be leading the video review session today. And our first topic is molecular orbitals. And we're going to talk about three main things. First, we're going to talk about electrons as a wave, in addition to being a particle. Then we're going to go into a discussion about how the wave nature of electrons allows them to be added together and subtracted, that we call constructive and destructive interactions, which will then bring us into a discussion about molecular orbitals and why they form and how they form. And then we're going to do a couple case studies of that, illustrating why diatomic helium doesn't exist, but HE2 plus can. So our first topic in this discussion of orbitals are electrons as a wave. Now, we're used to the idea of an electron as these discrete little dots that are free to orbit a nucleus, and they exist as points in space, as physical objects. And this is partly true, but electrons also function as a wave. The exact reason why electrons can be treated as waves is outside the scope of this course, but for our purposes, because electrons can be waves, they can be modeled mathematically with something called a wave function. Now, we represent the wave function with the Greek symbol psi, and this is just a three-dimensional mathematical model of where electrons are likely to be found. And when we solve these wave equations, we get these three-dimensional spaces. Um, sometimes they look like spheres. Sometimes they look like figure eights. Sometimes they look like lopsided figure eights. You should recognize these as the x orbital, the p orbital, and the sp orbital, because orbitals are just solutions to this wave equation. Um, they represent spaces where electrons are likely to be. One important consequence of electrons being waves is that we can do mathematical operations to them. We can take this wave equation and square it. And what that gives us is the probability of finding an electron. This has an important consequence. If something causes psi to go up, so too will psi squared go up. And thus, the probability of finding an electron in a particular region will increase. Conversely, if we decrease psi, we decrease psi squared, and the probability goes down. This is going to be very important when we talk about constructive and destructive interactions, and it's going to form the basis of how molecular orbitals themselves actually form. So, now that we know that electrons are also a wave, in addition to being a particle, this leads us into their mathematical properties. Because they're waves, they can be added and subtracted together, which we term constructive and destructive interactions. Let's go there now. Now, because electrons are waves, and they can be represented by mathematical functions, we can add them and subtract them together. In this top example here, I have two electrons, both being represented by a wave. And you should remember from math or from physics that if you add two waves that are in phase with each other, where the peaks correspond and the troughs correspond, they have this um, augmenting effect. And they get bigger. So the corresponding peaks and the corresponding troughs get larger as the sum of these two. We call this, when it happens with electrons, a constructive interaction. Conversely, we can have two waves that are out of phase with each other, um, where the trough corresponds to a peak of the other wave, and then vice versa. So when these two electrons, these two waves, come together, they're going to diminish each other because they effectively cancel each other out. And we call this, this diminishing effect, destructive interaction. And this is going to become very important when we talk about why molecular orbitals form the way they do. So, when two atoms come together and attempt to form a bond, they each bring with them electrons, bonding electrons, the ones that participate in that bond. And each of these electrons is a wave, represented by its own wave function, and it's already housed in its own orbital, which is a mathematical model, remember, of those wave functions. So, what happens when two orbitals come together? Let's say we just have an S orbital over here, hydrogen, and it's trying to form a bond with another hydrogen, and these electrons are, are both sitting in S orbitals. These two orbitals come together, and because they're wave functions, they interact. And they interact one of two ways. They interact constructively, additively, and they interact destructively, kind of like subtractively. And what happens when these two orbitals come together, interact constructively, is you get a new orbital that's been increased. The wave function's gotten bigger. And remember from our previous talk how we said when you increase the wave function, you increase the probability of finding an electron. So you make the first of two molecular orbitals where these two orbitals uh, interact in phase with each other, and they become more closely associated. We call this the bonding molecular orbital. 
and it is of lower energy than either of the two orbitals that spawned it. Now, because we have two orbitals being added together, anytime you add two orbitals in, you get two orbitals out. We have our constructive interference one already taken care of. The other way that orbitals can interact is destructively. So the out of phase portions of these two orbitals will interact, and they're going to make what's called the antibonding orbital. Now, there's no orbital overlap at all here. There's, there's actually a portion of the wave equation where the solution is zero, and it leads to this area where no electrons can be found. We call that the node. And again, we call this whole complex up here the antibonding orbital. And now, these orbitals are free to behave just like we expect any orbital to behave. We can put electrons into them. We can bump electrons up into the higher energy orbital. We can knock them into the lower energy one. And it's important to note that these molecular orbitals that form are symmetrical. If we take this to be an increasing plane of energy, it's the same distance to go from here back to our, our ground state, our unbonded orbitals, as it is to go from our ground state up to our antibonding orbitals. So we have two new orbitals and their relative energy distribution compared to their starting points. So now that we've painted a picture of orbitals being able to be added together and subtracted, and this creates our bonding and our antibonding orbitals, we're going to do a case study to show why diatomic helium does not exist, but He2 plus in its ionic form can. So now let's talk molecular orbitals of a case study. We have helium. The He2 non-existent molecule. We know that He2 doesn't exist. Helium exists as a monoatomic state in nature. And we're going to demonstrate with molecular orbitals why helium doesn't form bonds with itself. So we have two helium atoms here, and each of them has an s orbital. And in this s orbital, as we know, are two electrons. Now, if these two orbitals try to associate with one another, we're going to get two molecular orbitals out of that interaction. We're going to get a lower energy bonding orbital, and we're going to get a higher energy antibonding orbital. Remember, this results from the constructive interference. There's orbital overlap, and this is where electrons can be shared between the atoms. This has no orbital overlap, and it's higher energy, and there's no bond that can form here because the electrons can't get between the two atoms. And now we can take the electrons that each of the helium atoms bring to the picture, and we can just stick them into these orbitals and see what happens. So we have four electrons in total. Two will go into this bonding orbital. It's just like any other orbital. It can hold two electrons. And the antibonding orbital also gets two. And what this does is we have an energy benefit from putting these two uh, electrons into this bonding molecular orbital. But we have a destabilizing effect from putting them into this higher energy antibonding orbital. And the energy benefit and the energy detriment cancel each other out because the two energy distances are the same. So what happens is there's a net zero sum here. There's no energy benefit of forming this kind of orbital picture versus forming this one. So because there's no benefit to doing it, this interaction doesn't take place. And we don't see helium exist as a diatomic molecule in nature. We see it exist as straight helium. We can also use molecular orbitals to talk about kind of difficult molecules to portray, like He2+, which experimentally we know exists. But try to draw a Lewis structure for this, and you, you really can't. I, I dare you, right? I challenge you to draw an acceptable Lewis structure of He2+. It just doesn't work. But we can account for its existence with molecular orbital theory. Again, we have two helium um, atoms. They have their s orbitals with electrons inside them. These orbitals will associate. We're going to have a bonding molecular orbital at the bottom with the constructive orbital overlap, the interaction. We're going to get an antibonding orbital up here with a node with no orbital overlap. And this time, if it was He2+, plus, we've lost one electron from our last example. We have two electrons being brought by one helium, and we have one being brought by the other. So we have three electrons to put into these two orbitals. We have two that go into our bonding orbital, because again, we have to fill up the lower energy orbitals before we touch the higher one. And our third and last goes here. So now, we can see that we have two electrons pulling the energy of the system down to this more stable state. And we only have one electron up here counterbalancing that. So the net result is that we still have an energy 
decreasing effect on our system because we have two electrons down here pulling the system's energy down. And because of this, the final energy of the system is lower than it was before the bomb started. Lower energy is more stable. That's good in less than a chemical reaction. So you end up seeing this bond form, even though a Lewis structure would have predicted it would. So thank you, everyone. That's been the video about molecular orbitals. I hope you found this helpful. Um, stay tuned, because soon to come, there will be other videos about nomenclature and about Newman projections and other topics of interest in George's OCAM class. I wish you guys the best of luck in your studies, and thanks for your attention. Take care.